Hi, I'm Albert Lionel. For this code along, we're going to write code for the DJB2 hash in C. I encourage you to pull up your ID and follow along. We're going to first talk about the hash and then we'll go dive into code. The hash is developed by Daniel J. Bernstein and it was meant to be a simple hash that can be used a lot for hash tables and generate keys, ideally with very little collisions, very quickly. Now, the way the hash is set up is he started with an arbitrarily large number. In this case, 5,000, 5,381. Now this may seem sort of arbitrary, and I'll explain a little bit on why he chose this number. But then he says, take this number, and for every character in the string, go ahead and multiply this hash by 33 and add the character value. So you're saying for each character, so let's say my string is str, we can go ahead and say hash equals hash times 33 plus c. Now, the 33 was picked because it is close to the power of 2, 32. So there's actually some mathematical tricks that we can do to take out this multiplication, which we'll talk about in programming. The reason for this 531 is it gave the option to say we have an arbitrary large prime number that is not to a power of 2. So 2 to the k or 2 to the k minus 1, 5,381 is a prime number that's actually not error and even. It's sort of in between those ranges on there. Additionally, when you look at the lower bits, when you look at this in binary, there's a lot of ones in the lower bits, which helps reduce any problems of when you have a lower value hash of it just factoring down to zero later on, and so this helps reduce that. So it's things that were taken into account when you select this number. You almost always select primes when you start building a hash. But he took this into account. It is sort of arbitrary. There's other ones you could pick, but this is one that he picked, and this is one most people stick with because he picked it. But let's go ahead and dive into code, because that's ideally what we're wanting to go ahead and take a look at. So for this code, I encourage you to pull up your ID, follow along. I have generated some files to help us with testing. So because these files are here to help us with testing, they are available to download, just like the final code is available to download. But as always, I encourage you to code along as we do this. And the reason I generate these files is so we could generate a bunch of keys very quickly and then we can test those keys so we can look at collisions later. And how much does this help prevent collisions as compared to a simple one? Now, the code I generated is this random character. It creates a random character, then we do a random string. So it creates a string of set length you pass in with this random character and returns it. Remember, it adds that one, so you can do that final character on the string. And then, of course, we have the ability to shuffle strings. We have two strings of basically the same length and the same characters, which the characters are in different orders. And if sometimes if you have a hash and the characters are in different orders, I'll create a collision. Our job is not to do that. So let's go ahead and create a test of this and see what happens when we go ahead and test it. So I'm going to say, all right, we're going to say care star my test equals random string. We're going to do a string length five. Then we can go ahead and print f percent f backslash n. Always nice to have the new line. My test. I can go ahead and compile and run this, which you saw you us working with earlier. And it creates a random string. Do it again, another random string. Now I can test the shuffle just to see what's going on with the code that I'm doing. So I'll say shuffle string, my test, I'll print out percent test, backslash in, and then my test again. And I'll go ahead and run it. And same strings each time, just in different orders for the characters. So we're seeing that. Now, is this necessarily for us to develop a hash? No. But whenever you're given code, it's always good to test it and see what it does, get your idea of what's going on. So we've tested it. We'll come back later. Now let's talk about the hash. I mentioned that when he designed this, he wanted to use unsigned long integer or unsigned long numbers. Now, to make my life easier, I'm going to go ahead and type def and do unsigned long as ul, or just ul. So we have this unsigned long ul, and now I can go ahead and create my new function that go ahead and returns a ul, and it returns djb2 is what we'll call it, and we'll set this to takes in a string. 
Now, technically, I could have anything when I do this by just doing the string. There is a way that I can find the end of a string. That backslash zero does help determine the end of a string. We'll go from there. We know my final value is going to first start with the hash she created. So it's going to be 5381, that prime number. We're going to return that hash. As always, once you create your skeleton of function, compile. Make sure you didn't miss anything like semicolon or things like that. It's just great practice to get into. We're going to have our constant, which will be constant, which we'll be calculating. We could do this through a for loop. I'm actually going to do a trick with a while loop because it's a convenient way to do it. So we have while, and we're going to do an assignment in a while loop. This is allowed in C. Not allowed in all languages for good reasons. It can be somewhat confusing, but it's very common to do in C. And what I'm saying is my constant, or my character, I mean my character is equal to the pointer. We're going to increment the pointer. But if this character is ever backslash zero, stop looping. So as long as it's not that, it's going to keep going. The moment it is actually the zero character that ends strings, we're nowhere at the end of the strings, we're going to do it. Now, if I used his algorithm directly, I would end up saying hash equals hash times 33 plus C. 100% valid. Let me go ahead and run this right now. We're going to go ahead and say hash. Let's see what since it's a UL key equals bjv2. I'm going to go ahead and pass in my test. I'm going to print f. Now it's L U when you do printf, by the way, for a long um, unsigned long. And we're going to pass in key. And then I'm going to go ahead and run it. See what happens. Great. I uh, probably should put backslash in. It'll make my printing out easier to see. Great. It's generating a long number. Right now, I'm only doing the first one. I'm not really comparing them. Let me go ahead and compare both of them. So I'll go ahead and take this code. And before my shuffle, I'll generate another one and print it, which means I do need to get rid of my other declaration here. I'll just override it. There, now I have it grow, grouped into different groups. We'll go ahead and run this. All right, and you notice that even though it's the same characters, right away it does generate a different value at the end, especially the key being that your last, no pun intended, the key being that your last little bits are different. So if we mod this, for example, by, oh, let's say we have an array of 100. Let me go ahead and run this. Now I may get a warning on this because it may want me to go back to an end. No, it didn't. We have two different values even though we're modding it by 100. It doesn't end up with the same value. So that's not a bad idea. Now the problem is, is one of the things is multiplication can be really expensive when you're programming. And the more you can avoid a multiplication, the better it can be, especially when you're dealing with algorithms that need to be blindingly quick because no one wants it to wait for this hash algorithm every time you store something in a hash table or pull things from a hash table. Well, the nice thing about this being 33 is this is actually equivalent to doing a left shift of 5. And then adding Z to it. Oh, left shift of 5 plus hash. And then adding C to it. And the reason why is a left shift of 5 is basically the equivalent of adding 5 bits to it or the... Um, 1,000 or 32 to it plus the 3, the hash, and you end up getting the same as multiplying it on out. You have that, and now I can run the same thing. Of course, it's going to be random, so it'll be hard to tell that's the same thing, but we're go ahead and we can generate this. And while the speed difference for doing this wasn't that much at the beginning, if we had arbitrary long would have that. So this right here is the DJB2 hash. Now let's test it. Let's see how many collisions we get when we start dealing with long numbers. So we go ahead and do a static ant collisions equals zero. 
And now I want to say, all right, I'm going to go ahead and build a bunch of random strings. And I'm going to do this maybe for int. Int i equals 100, while i is less than, oh, we'll make it, one, sorry, 100 and i is 0. And then i plus plus. And we're also going to create an array. So we'll say temp. So we got this temp array. It's got 100 values. It's got 100 spots in it. We're going to do 100 values. We're going to see if we end up with any collisions while we have these values. And the idea is it's going to be 0 for each one. We're going to put 1 in there if we happen to have it. And we can go from there. And then we're going to say, all right. So we have this. Let's go ahead and generate a random string. It is so car string my string equals the random string, and we'll just pick five for now. It could be longer, it could be less, but it's five. We'll go ahead and say, all right, DJ B2, well. Hash equals d djb2. I'm going to toss in my string. And then, because we need a range to stay, stay in this array, we're going to mod it by the size of the array. In this case, it is 100. Pretty common. That'll give me a range between 0 and 99. And then I'm going to check if temp, and we're going to say hash equals 1. So it equals 1, we're going to increment our collisions. We're going to say, all right, we found a collision, we're going to ignore it. However, if it doesn't equal 1, we are going to make it 1. So temp hash equals 1. So we're saying, all right, if we found it, it's going to call it a collision. If we haven't found it, then we're going to set it to one, and that's what we're doing for now. Now, that isn't necessarily the best way to always detect collisions. You'd really be storing the key value inside of there, but we have this idea where we can go from here. Or it depends if you're creating the nodes or not. It depends on how you store it. Now, let's go ahead and print at our end. Our collisions and see how many we end up getting with an array of 100. So theoretically, if we do this, we'll have 100. There's a chance of at least a couple collisions. And let's see how many get when we generate this. We got 44 collisions, 33 collisions. So we're still getting about a third collisions, but it's not too bad. It's pretty consistent what we're getting. Sometimes it gets pretty high. You have to remember, we are literally generating enough things that should fill every spot in the race. So a few collisions is not surprising. Let's go ahead and add to this and go ahead and shuffle. And then we'll go ahead and do this again, which are which automatically if I'm doing it again, I probably should say, hey, look, I can go ahead and um, make a function out of it. We just won't this time. So now I'm sitting here saying, all right, we have our collisions. We've got this. Let's go ahead and run it and see how our collisions do once I shuffle the string. Does it go up exponentially or does it stay roughly the same? It is still generating a lot more collisions. Now, mind you, we did not double the size of our array. So let's go ahead and do this at 200 because we're storing twice as many values. And now let's go ahead and run the collisions. So it looks like more, but it, percentage wise, it is still roughly the same. Now, this is where your load factor comes in. How large do I make this array so I have minimal collisions? But I'm also not wasting tons of room. Let's up it to 500 and see what happens. We're storing 200 values in a 500 array. There, hopefully, we don't have very many collisions, but we still end up with some collisions. 
is this a perfect key generator? No, or hash. But does it do better than in the case of the simple key where you end up just adding all the characters together? Far better because we're guaranteed to collide every single time with those in addition to the collisions of us finding it the same module or the same space when we do the mod. But overall, that actually isn't that bad for the number of collisions, and some of them may only be one or two deep. They may not, they're not saying they're 43 deep, it's just saying this is what it is. Now I could modify this, and this would be a great modification to do on your own, is instead of storing one in there, store the number of times it does collisions, and then try to print out your array at the end so you can see the total number of collisions and how many spots had more than one on the collision. Maybe you only print out the ones that have more so you don't have all the zeros. But these are different things you can play with to try to help better understand hash functions. And there's a lot out there. You will see this shift is used a lot. Once again, because they're trying to get rid of the multiplication because it's much faster in a computer processor to shift a few bits than it is to multiply. But overall, I encourage you to keep working at this, keep practicing. If you notice when you do the code along, I purposely compiled a lot. I tested the code that was provided. I tested the code that I created so I would get a better idea of what's going on. You should do the same. And above all, happy coding. Thank you.